Hello and welcome to the Speaking Archaeologically lecture on Kushana coinage. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss how numismatics serve as a tool for piecing together history, especially for the Kushan Empire. During the 1st to mid-3rd century CE, Kushans represented a major world power occupying the region of Central Asia and Northern India. However, the history of the Kushans received minimal attention from historians. Strangely, the Purans and Mahabharat or any historical sources from India do not mention Kushan name. However, they may have been denoted by other names such as Tokhari, Tuskar, Tushar, Tukhara. Purans mention the number of kings to be 14, but without any specific period of reign. Fokari have been mentioned as a tribe of nomads in classical western sources who happen to have invaded Bactria. The dates of Yu Chi tribe, according to Chinese dynastic annals, of entering the region are at the same time. Thus, it can be assumed that Kushans were probably the same set of people. And various theories about Kushan origins also factors in this dichotomy. Archaeology thus serves as a major tool in reconstructing the history of the Kushan Empire. However, that too is seldom well employed by various historians when it comes to dating the Kushan period and their history. Let us first talk about what has been reconstructed archaeologically about the Kushan Empire, in which coins and inscribed seals from the empire have played a major role. Kujula Karafesis engineered the policy of unification of the Yuchi tribes, and his conquests record that he invaded the lands of Parthia and captured the districts of what he calls Kaofu, which was probably Kabul. This area for a long time was ruled by the Indo Greeks and later captured by the Scythians or the Scythians. The Kushans, thus, were the fourth set of people to come into the region. The unification roughly dates back to 35 BCE and the policy of expansion was continued by Kanishk I who led the conquests deeper towards the Indo-Gangetic plains. Inscriptions and seals referring to him have been found in Allahabad and Banaras. And of course, the Gandhara and the Mathura school of art bear a testimony to all of this. A Tibetan work refers to his conquests of Saket situated in the locality adjoining Ayodhya. This is also supported by a textual document called the Hu Han Shu. He is also considered to have invaded Patliputra. However, there is no evidence of this annexation by the Kushan Empire. The same was the case with the Chasthans of Western India. The Kushan dynasty thus and its political empire can be dated with the help of the gold and the copper coins recovered from the areas where they were ruling. The dynasty reached its zenith during the rule of Kanishk's successor, Huvishk. Many of the gold and copper coins from the Kushan period were resultantly stuck by Huvishk. In the year 60 CE of the Kanishk era, Vasudev I succeeded the throne from Huvishk. Alongside Vasudev, the numismatic evidence refers to the existence of Kanishk II. The period of Vasudev I marks the period of decline of Kushan dynasty. And this too can be corroborated by his coins, as we will see further. A lot of initial studies regarding Kushan coinage included only five kings. This includes the study of Alexander Cunningham, which is supposed to be the first work in the study of Kushan coinage. That too factors in only five kings, namely Kujula Kadephesis, Vima Kadephesis, Kanishk I, Huvishk and Vasudev. However, later studies revealed a large chronology of kings. And we are going to study about these in detail now. Kushans started issuing coins around 50 CE, adapting to the coins already in use for their purposes. Their stamping procedures and coin configuration were an augmentation of the customs of Greek-style coinage, effectively current in the territory over three centuries. Numerous parts of the Greek coin configuration were adjusted first by the Indo-Greek lords in the 2nd century BCE. 
Thus, to quite an extent, the Kushan coinage was an extension of the Indo-Greek coins we've already studied before. Bilingual engravings, such as the ones seen in the Greek coins, were also found on the Kushan coins. So whilst you had Greek engravings on the obverse, the reverse generally had engravings in Brahmi and Karoshti. Two separate styles of Brahmi emerged within the Kushan Empire and both of these can be read and have been deciphered using their coinage. Apart from these characteristics, Kushan coins also exhibit a continuation of depiction of imperial pictures. However, a break from the existing Greek style, here is the busts were replaced with full-figure imperial pictures of the king or the issuing authority. In addition to this, the Kushan coins also include engravings which state the names and the titles of the issuing ruler aside from a couple of situations where in the coins the name of the previous ruler and his titles have been recorded and thus the coins then serve as a proceeding after their death issue which is a unique feature which you do not find in the Indo-Greek, Indo-Parthian or Scythian rulers. The Kushans additionally have also been accredited with being the first rulers to issue the gold coins. Although the evidence for this is debatable, what's worth noticing that the Kushan coinage never had standard weights or standard measures unlike many of the ancient coins. So there's no standard weight for copper or gold coins of the Kushan period and their purity is also dubitable as a result of which a lot of numismatists think of these coins as forgeries or fake issues. Also, determining a forgery in, in case of a Kushan coin becomes incredibly hard owing to the fact that there are no standard weights to put them against. Having discussed the basic history of Kushans as well as their coins, let's now look into the details of Kushan coinage. The first set is the coins of Kujula Cadifesis. The coins issued by Kujula Cadifesis were entirely of copper except the posthumous silver tetradrams of Hermes. The coins were of five types. The first among these is the Hermes and Heracles type. The obverse side of the coin bears the bust of the king to the right, copying coin design of Hermes. There is Greek inscription in the coin and it gives out the name Hermes. The reverse side inscribes Heracles or Hercules standing to the front. His head is turned to the left and he is shown holding a club in his right hand and a lion skin in his left. This is very similar to a few Indo-Greek coins that we have discussed in the previous lecture. Apart from these, there is also Karoshti inscription on the coin which gives the name Kujula Cadifesis. The second type of coin is the head of Augustus type. On the obverse side of the coin, there is a Roman head tilted towards the right wearing a diadem. The reverse side has the image of Kujula Cadifesis, who appears wearing long trousers and wearing pointed hats and boots. He holds a sword in his hand. The Karoshti inscription on the top reads Kujula Cadifesis, and the coin is in sync with an existing Greco-Roman type which was very very common in Bactria under Indo-Greeks. This coin shows a continuation in tradition and this was probably done to not destabilize the existing economic system to quite a lot of extent because if coins were issued owing to a complete previous prototype then chances of it being refuted or refused by people in the economy were very less. We have discussed this point before. The third type of coin is the seated king type. The obverse side has the image of Zeus. The reverse has Kujula Cadifesis himself seated. Again, this is a coin which is very similar to the Scythian coin of Mos Aziz I. The fourth type is the bull and camel type. The obverse side has a bull and two humped camels on the reverse. These animals were common to the Scythian coinage as well. And this is something which we will see in the Hindu Shahi coins later on, also prevalent in the same area. The one difference in this coin is 
Instead of Aziz the first, Kujula Kadafis's himself is shown riding the camel as a war vehicle. The fifth type of coin is the coin of the Macedonian soldier. The obverse has the king's bust. The reverse side features a soldier with a spear to the right. There is also the name of the king in Karoshti inscription. Again, this is known as the horseman warrior type in the later period. And again, this will be seen in tandem with the bull in the Hindu Shahi coins when we discuss them later on. Let us now move on to the coins of Vima Takto. Strictly speaking, very little innovation or stylistic difference was observed in the coins of Bhima Takto. This was probably because of the shortness of his reign and also the immediacy of his accession. The coins of Bhima Takto are usually uninscribed. They had a male figure wearing a hat and holding a spear riding a horse and generally the bust of the king on the obverse side. Other types of his coins were similar to the bull and camel types of Kujula Cadifesis. However, very little has been found in terms of written content, usually in Greek and Karoshti. Let us come to the coins of Vima Cadifesis now. There was a lot of variety in the coinage of Vima Cadifesis, which included copper and gold coins. However, the source of gold coins is dubitable because of lack of any mineable orum sites in the Kushan Empire. It is therefore possible that a lot of Roman gold, which was incurred into the empire owing to spice trade, was then molten to mint coins at the time of Vima Cadifesis. However, there are no archaeological sources to corroborate this. The types of Vima Cadifesis coins include the famous king on the altar type, where the king features wearing a nomad's dress and stands on the altar and is seen to be performing a ritual. This coin type has been subsequently minted by Kushan kings from this point onwards. The Makadifesis also initiated the minting of Shiva figure on the coin. The Shiva figure with the bull might have been primarily minted to win over the population. Some other predominant types of this point were the elephant rider, the enthroned king, the king seated cross-legged and the bust portrait with high helmet. The most striking feature of these coins is all of them bear a Shiva figure on the reverse which has at least three heads and has then been identified by a lot of people as a direct evidence of Kushan's patronizing Shaivism. A point worth noting here is a standardized weight finally appears for the Kushan coins under the aegis of Vima Cadifesis. So the Kushan coins from this point in history start weighing 8 grams each, a standard that is followed throughout in the Kushan dynasty. The next king of prominence in terms of coinage is Kanishk I. Coins of Kanishk were less pretentious than those of Vima in having the king's royal portrait in only two modest types. Also, these coins ditched the bilingual approach followed by his predecessors, the Parthians, the Sarkas, and introduced a Middle Iranian Bactrian language on both sides of the coins. Changes were also brought in the names of gods and the title of the king. Kanishk used Iranian words for both. The most prominent coin type of Kanishk is the Basileus type. The obverse side has the king wearing rounded cap of a different design, standing to the left on a low rounded altar with a spear in left hand. The figure is dressed in a long tunic possessing a sword whose pommel is shaped like a head of an animal and is wearing a belt with double unit buckle. The right shoulder is seen as flaming. The coin follows the king on altar type of Vima Cadifesis but introduces the spear which in the later coins becomes a regular appearance. The next type is the Shao Nan Ho type. The obverse side is the same as that of coin 1 that we've already discussed, but it has a low rounded cap on the head of the king and the devices on either side of the king are unidentifiable. There's also an elephant goad in the right hand of the king. The third prominent type is the seated king type. The king is seen as frontally sitting upon a wide throne with square sides. 
His right hand is placed in Abhe Mudra and he wears a wide brimmed hat and voluminous trousers. This is perhaps the most prominent Kushan coin that all of you might have seen earlier. Two minor copper mints were opened in Kanishk's reign in Gandhar and Kashmir. They still made occasional use of Kharosh tea. The Gandharan mint employed Kharosh tea early in the reign of Huvishka and the Kashmir mint through the reigns of Kanishk and Huvishk, whereas all other mints had completely adopted Bactrian. Thus, we see that the posture of the king and the divinities were an important part of the Kushan coins. Let us note down a few deities that appear most commonly in the Kushan coins. All through the rules of Kanishk I and Huvishk, and presumably in the primary years of Vasudev I's rule, the mints used about 20 gods, in spite of the fact that a little gathering of six dominate almost all coins. These are Adroshko, Mao, Nero, Nana, Vesho or High Mountaineer, with certain others such as Uedo, Faro, Shaurero. In addition to these, Buddha makes a late appearance towards the end of the reign of Kanishk. This is worth noting down because under Kanishk, Buddhism splits into Hinayan and Mahayan during the fourth Buddhist council in Kashmir. A direct implication of this event is that Kanishk himself was a Mahayanist. Why else would a ruler allow such a split? Let's now talk about these coins in detail. The Buddha coins of Kanishk appear both in copper and gold. In copper, the coins portray both standing pictures of Buddha Shakyamuni and sitting pictures of the future Buddha Metre. Let us finally talk about denominations towards the end of this lecture. Broadly, there are three denominations in which Kushan coins occurred. The first among these is Drams. The second is Tetradrams. And the third is Deidra Drams or half a drum. Their weights fluctuate and reduce to about 5 grams during the reigns of Kanishk and Huvishk. As a result, type degradation becomes evident right after Kanishk's reign in Kushan coins. In terms of their legacy and influence, you will find that a lot of Puranic gods in the Hindu pantheon were actually deities that Kushans first included in their coins. Vesho, also synonymous for high mountain air, is something which the Kushans incorporated from the Scythian coins and later came to be interpreted as Shiva. The Kushan coinage also had a significant and direct impact on Gupta coinage, which we will be taking up next.